Okay guys, in this video we're going to talk uh, a little bit about electrolyte solutions. And so we're going, to, uh, we're going to go through some different examples of electrolytes. And what we want to be able to do is to distinguish uh, the types of changes that accompany the dissolution process when we form um, an electrolyte solution from an ionic electrolyte versus a covalent electrolyte. So you'll see what I mean. Ionic electrolytes, they undergo a physical dissociation. Covalent electrolytes, they undergo a chemical dissociation. And then we can, oh, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about uh, intermolecular interactions uh, between the solute and the solvent. Uh, and so we'll talk about the energetics of ionic electrolytes. So uh, this slide uh, just introduces some basic definitions. Uh, the term dissociation refers to a uh, physical or chemical reaction that involves the separation of a species into smaller particles. Uh, an electrolyte is a solute that dissociates into ions and as, we've, as I've alluded to, uh, that electrolyte can be either an ionic compound or a molecular compound, a covalent compound. The term non-electrolyte refers to a solute that does not dissociate into ions. And then when we do have an electrolyte solution, we can, we can talk about the relative, um, the relative degree of ioniza ionization in terms of strong versus weak electrolytes. And so a strong electrolyte is one that completely dissociates to form ions. A weak electrolyte is one that only partially dissociates to form ions. So the cartoon here below illustrates the difference between these different terms. Uh, ethanol, which is not a diatomic molecule, <laughs> uh, we, we looked at the structure of ethanol in the previous, in the previous video. Ethanol is an alcohol that looks like this, and it dissolves readily in water because it can interact with the water through the hydrogen bonding, uh, but it doesn't ionize. And so when you, um, when you hook up these electrodes here that are dipped in the solution to an external power source, uh, water itself is non-conducting, so H2O is not a good conductor. However, when you dissolve electrolytes in the water, the electrolytes are very good conductors because they're charged, they're, they're ions. And so, uh, you know, the reason you don't mess around with the circuit box when the basement is flooded, or at least you need to be very, very careful, uh, it's not due to the water, it's due to all of the ions in the water uh, that, that could lead to electrocution. So if you have you know, pure water with ethanol dissolved in it, no ions are formed there, and so when you complete the circuit, no electricity flows. Ethanol is what we call a non-electrolyte. Potassium chloride, on the other hand, readily dissolves in water, and for emphasis, I often you don't have to. I like to put the H2O above the arrow just to let me know that I'm dissolving the solid in water. Uh, it readily dissociates to form ions. In fact, 100% of the potassium chloride that dissolves will form ions, and so HCl is what we call a strong electrolyte. Sorry. Well, HCl is a strong electrolyte, but this is KCl, potassium chloride, is a strong electrolyte. Other electrolytes, so for example, acetic acid, which is the active ingredient in vinegar, it only partially dissociates. In fact, acetic acid is a molecular compound, and it reacts with the water by donating a proton 
Here's the dissolution reaction there. Proton is donated to the water, so that's a chemical dissociation. It forms the hydronium ion, leaves behind acetate. Only a small fraction of the acetic acid molecules do this, something like between 3 and 5 percent. And that's why we use the double-sided arrow to indicate that this reaction doesn't go to completion. There's some back reaction as well. Because the acetic acid only partially dissociates, we classify acetic acid as a weak electrolyte. And they've indicated that here in the diagram by showing the light that is less bright than it is for the strong electrolyte. Okay, so you do get some uh, transmission of current here, but not to the same extent that you do with the strong electrolyte solution. All right, well, let's talk more about um, ionic electrolytes. So we'll talk about ionic electrolytes here. Ionic electrolytes, this is a solute that is an ionic compound, and it physically dissociates to give us ions. So the potassium chloride that we looked at just now, that's an example of an ionic electrolyte. Let's talk about the different energies at work here in forming a solution. Uh, the lattice energy refers to the electrostatic interactions, those so-called Coulomb interactions, that hold the ions together in the crystal. Okay, so the lattice energy tends to keep the ions in the crystal. The so-called solvation energy, or the hydration energy, is due to the interactions between the dissolved ions and the dipole moment of the water molecules. So the hydration energy is the intramolecular interaction between the uh, between the the solute and the solvent for the case of an ionic electrolyte. And so that tends to stabilize the solution. Right? So the hydration energy wants to pull the ions out of the crystal. So the lattice energy keeps the ions in the crystal. The hydration energy pulls the ions out of the crystal. We also have an entropy effect due to the fact that you would be mixing the ions with the solvent and that tends to stabilize the solution. But for us what we're going to focus on are the, are the energies. Now here's, uh, here's where it gets a little interesting and a lot more complicated. Both the lattice energy and the hydration energy increase with the ions charge density. Now, charge density here, I, what I'm doing is I'm using this to, to take two rules and combine them into one. The charge density depends upon both the charge and the size of the ion. So I'm just going to put size down below. Okay. So the lattice energy, that is the energy that increase, that, that holds the ions in the crystal, it increases with the size of the, with the, magnitude of the charges. Okay, so for example, if we were to compare sodium chloride lattice energy to zinc oxide lattice energies, the zinc oxide would have the larger lattice energy because it has the larger magnitude of charge compared to the magnitudes for sodium chloride. The same thing is true for the hydration energy, right? The interaction between, for example, here's a nice picture. This is showing us the interaction between a chloride ion and the uh, water molecules. Uh, recall that water has a dipole moment. The uh, electropositive end of the water molecule is near the hydrogens, and then the electronegative end is towards the oxygen. So you've got a partial positive charge out in this region, partial negative charge out in that region. So the hydrogens that are electropositive are going to want to interact with the anions, whereas the oxygen end 
of the molecule, the electronegative end, is going to want to interact with the, the cations. Okay. The larger the charge, right, potassium's plus one, chloride's minus one, the larger the charge, so if you were to compare the hydration energy between, say, potassium chloride here and the zinc oxide, the hydration energy for the zinc and the oxide are going to be larger than they are for the potassium and the chloride, okay, just to do the bigger charge. So just to, just to recap this one little part, both the lattice energy, which tends to keep the ions in the crystal, and the hydration energy, that is the interaction that tends to pull the ions out of the crystal, they both increase with the ion charge, the magnitude of the charges. They also both decrease with the size of the ion, which is interesting. Okay, The idea here, let's take the lattice energy for example. So let's compare sodium fluoride to sodium chloride. Okay. The interaction between the two ions depends upon how close the ions are to one another. In fact, the closer the ions are, the larger the interaction. Now, fluoride is a relatively small ion compared to the chloride ion. Okay? You know, as you go down the periodic table, the ionic radii get bigger and bigger. Okay? Now, because fluoride is a smaller ion than chloride, that means that the sodium ion is going to be able to get closer to the fluoride ion. As a consequence of that, the lattice energy between them is going to be stronger than it is between the sodium and the chloride. And so the lattice energy is going to decrease with the size. As the size gets bigger and bigger, the charge density gets smaller, and so will the lattice energy. The same thing is also true of the hydration energy. Okay, So for a very big ion, the dipole moment of the water can't get close to the charge, to the center of charge. And so the bigger the ion is, the smaller the, uh, the hydration energy. So if you were to compare the hydration energy of fluoride to chloride, the fluoride is going to have the larger hydration energy. The chloride, because it's a bigger ion, will have the smaller lattice energy, or the smaller hydration energy. OK, so that's, it's, it's pretty complicated. And, and as a result, uh, you get some really interesting things occurring because both the lattice energy and the hydration energy, which have opposite effects, they both depend in the same way on the ion charge and on the ion size. And so as a consequence of that, you have this, this competition between the two. And that's what makes ionic solubility so complicated. So recall the solubility rules from, from general chemistry, uh, from general chemistry one. Uh, and they had all sorts of exceptions. Some ionic compounds are soluble, some are insoluble. And it's, it's very difficult to predict, just using this, the ionic compounds formula, which ones are going to be soluble and which ones are not. Now we have some, some reasonably good rules that you can use, but they have a lot of exceptions, as you recall. And the reason there's so many exceptions is because of this interesting uh, interaction, this interesting competition between the lattice energy and the hydration energy and the ion's charge density. And so the, the, those features are illustrated here. I do need you to know that the lattice energy is what holds the ions together in the crystal, and the hydration energy is what pulls the ions out of the crystal. So that's the most important thing that you need to know. Uh, if you can sort out this business with the lattice energy and the hydration energy and the charge density, that's great. Um, here's a simple, a very simple application of it, and you, you, you really wouldn't need to know it any better than you, you know it now. For example, you don't need to learn how to justify the solubility rules using these ideas. If you want to explore that yourself, uh, 
that's great, uh, but but don't don't expect that it's going to be um, uh, something you need to worry about for uh, a, a, an assessment like a test or something. Okay. Um, which of the following has the larger hydration energy, sodium or potassium? Well, the hydration energy, recall, is the interaction between uh, the, the ions and the dipole moment of water. And the way it works is that the closer the water molecules can get to the ion, the stronger the hydration energy. Water molecules can get closer to a smaller ion. Okay, and so of these two, sodium plus is going to be the smaller ion than the potassium. And the reason I know that is, is I'm, I'm using my mental image of the periodic table, which if I um, pull this up real quick, should have had it ready to go for you. Uh, let's see, where'd my periodic table go? Oh, here it is. I'm using content that we learned from Chem 120 where we learned the periodic trends and one of the periodic trends that you learned about was the ionic radii. As you go down the periodic table you go from a small shell and I'm talking about the electron shells right this is the the n equals one shell, n equals two shell, n equals three shell, n equals four shell etc. As you go to larger and larger principal quantum numbers, the shells, the electron shells, get larger and larger and larger, further and further away from the nucleus. So the potassium cation is going to have, it's going to be isoelectronic with argon. The sodium cation is going to be isoelectronic with neon. Okay, The electronic shell for a potassium plus ion is going to be larger than the electronic shell for a sodium plus ion. Okay, So the radius of the potassium plus is larger, therefore the water molecules cannot get as close to the potassium ion as they can to the sodium ion, and so the hydration energy with the sodium ion is going to be larger than it will be with the potassium ion. Okay, so the answer to part A is the sodium plus. For part B here, we have a hypothetical ionic compound, AB2, and we're told that it is very soluble in water. Okay, so AB2 is soluble. And then we have another hypothetical compound, CB2. Notice that the B is the same in both. So B is going to correspond to the same anion. And this one's only slightly soluble in water. Okay. We're told that the lattice energies for these compounds are about the same. What would be an explanation for the solubility difference? between these two compounds. Why could CB2 be more soluble in water than, uh, uh, less soluble in water than AB2? Well, if it's not the lattice energy, then it has to be the hydration energy. There has to be some difference in the hydration energy. And the more soluble species is going to have a higher hydration energy than CB2. Now that extra hydration energy is not going to come from the anion, right, because the anion is the same in both. It's going to have to come from the cation. Okay, so it, the, the hydration energy of the cation A must be larger than the hydration energy of cation C. Well, is that larger hydration cation, uh, larger hydration energy of cation A, is it due to the charge of the cation, or is it due to the size of the cation? And we might want to think about that for, for a second. Notice that the internal stoichiometry of the two compounds is the same. Right? So what I'm saying here is that the charge of the cation, so whatever this plus I'll call it plus Z is. These two cations have to have the same charge because there's two of the corresponding same anion. So whatever the charge is on the anion, I'll call it minus 
z2. And I'll call this plus z1. All right. These must both add up to 0. Now we know that these two numbers are the same. Therefore, these numbers have to be the same. So A and B cations have the same charge, just due to the stoichiometry. So if they have the same charge, then the difference must be in the size of the ions. So A and C must have different sizes. Now, is the size of, of cation A going to be larger than the size of cation C, or is it going to be smaller? Well, we need the hydration energy for A to be smaller. In order for the hydration, I'm sorry, we need the hydration energy of A to be larger than that of C. So in order for it to be larger, the water must be able to get closer to that cation. That means that A must have a smaller radius. Okay, so the explanation that I would provide for this uh, example is to say that the ionic radius of A must be smaller than the ionic radius of cation C. And that's why AB2 is more soluble than CB2. Okay, that's pretty tricky, right? There's a lot of logic that goes into that. If you want to think about these things and ponder them, that's great. Uh, if you're more interested in moving on to the, the material that's going to be more represented on the exam, then, then I suggest you do that. Let's talk next about covalent electrolytes. So that was ionic electrolytes. This business with the lattice energy and the hydration energy. Uh, yeah, and the hydration energy. Let's talk now about covalent electrolytes. Uh, covalent electrolytes do not physically dissociate. They chemically dissociate to yield ions. Okay, so a covalent electrolyte is a molecular compound that has all covalent bonds. And in order to form ions, you have to break those covalent bonds. A great example is hydrochloric acid, which is a molecular compound, right? HCl, hydrogen, covalently bonded to chlorine. Okay, that's a molecular compound. Dissolved HCl will chemically react with the water by donating a proton to the water, leaving behind the chloride anion. Okay, so that's where you get the, the ions from. You form hydronium, that's this species here, and then the chloride ion aqueous. So you have to chemically break the bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine to form, uh, to form the ions. And as I said before, HCl is very strong, we use a one-directional arrow because 100% of the dissolved HCl will dissociate. We mentioned acetic acid previously. I drew the structure. Well, I drew the formula. I don't think I drew the structure. Acetic acid is pretty important, so let me draw that. It helps if I show you the paper. So this is what acetic acid looks like. Make sure I'm getting it right. All right, we've got these protons here. These are not acetic protons. However, this proton is acetic. So when, when this guy reacts with water, what happens is, is this proton gets donated away to the water, and that's going to leave behind the acetate anion. I forgot some electrons there. It's OK. And that thing's got a negative charge on it. Okay, so that's the, the acetate here. Now this, this only happens for a small percentage, about 5% of the acetic acid molecules. And so we don't use a one-directional arrow, we use this bi-directional arrow. 
uh, to indicate that not all of the acetic acid is going to dissociate. Okay, so that's the weak electrolyte. Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop this video here, and we'll talk about um, what solubility is in the next one.